Welcome to our detailed review of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set from the Op, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this battling card game along with its, with its expansions. The Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set, which I'm probably going to call Disney Sorcerer's Arena or just Sorcerer's Arena going forward, was designed by Sean Fletcher, published in 2022 by the Op, otherwise known as USAopoly. This is a two to four player card driven miniature skirmish game with a sliding difficulty scale featuring games that take under an hour. Now, while the box says this game is for 13 plus, we think much younger kids could totally get into this one if sticking to the early chapters. The MSRP on this core set is $39.99 USD. That's right. For the price of one character for a cash price in the mobile game, you get a full game with six characters. <laughs> So take on the role as summoners in Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Conjure up your favorite Disney and Pixar characters to battle each other in the hex-gridded arena. This core set includes Sorcerer Mickey, Maleficent, Sully, Aladdin, Dr. Fusilier, Gaston, Demona, and Ariel. Through the use of movement and action cards, you will use your character to control key points on the map Knock out your rivals in a race to have the most crowns. Picking which characters to use and figuring out how they work together is going to be a key to victory, as is managing your hand of cards. Different game chapters let you scale the difficulty, making this great for gamers of all ages and experience levels. Now, while this game is based on the popular Disney Sorcerer's Arena mobile game and shares some of the same look and concepts, the actual gameplay is completely different. Mm -hmm. One of the best things about this new Disney game are the components, which you can check out in our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Adventures Core Box unboxing video on YouTube. <laughs> now, the components in this Disney battle game are exceptionally nice. Good quality cards for each characters, oversized character cards, very useful reference sheets, including different ones for different chapters, a nice compact to pulled board, nice thick cardboard punch outs, clear instructions, and great-looking acrylic standees. A nice touch is that the eight character standees are two-sided acrylic made of two pieces glued together so that the artwork is on the inside. Each character has a back and front and show and use plastic rings to show which team they are on as well as tracking their current health. Now, I thought these were awesome. They look great, and I actually appreciate the 2D cartoon cell look of them. When they're out on the table. The only issue at all I have with these, and you get to see it in our unboxing video, is that they come with a film on each side that is really annoying to get off. The only thing is you only have to do it once. So once you get through that initial annoying thing to start playing, it's done. Overall, component wise, I was very impressed by this new Disney game from the op. You know, when when they put those plastic covers on electronics, they leave a little tab. They need yeah. to start doing that on the acrylic it's standees, <laughs> yes, standees. something. Al know. Let's move on to what you do with these components with an overview of play. Okay, a couple quick things to cover here. So first off, the rules for this game, as I mentioned earlier, are presented in multiple chapters. There are four of them, which, while great for onboarding, takes way too long to go through here. Here's what you learn in chapter one, and here's what gets added in two, and here's what changes in three. Instead, what we're going to describe here are the full rules, what you get once you are playing with chapter four, which is the, the final set of rules. Next, this is a two player skirmish game with a lot going on, most of which is determined by the cards in play. Like most dueling card games, a lot of the actual gameplay comes out on the cards, not in the rules for how and when to play them. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to how to play. You start each game by having the players draft their team. The start player picks one of the available characters to play, then the other player picks two, then it goes back to the first player to pick their third character, and then the second player makes their third choice. Players then determine the order they want their three characters to act. Teams reveal this information simultaneously, and an intuitive track is made beside, initiative track is made beside the board. Players then gather the standees, the oversized character cards, and card decks for their chosen characters. A colored ring is placed on each standee, 
and they are placed into the starting areas on the edge of the board. The card decks are shuffled together, and character cards are laid out in front of the players in initiative order. Now, each player is going to look at their character cards that summarize all your different abilities and stats and stuff and figure out your hand limit by adding up the hand limit for each individual character. You're then going to draw that number of cards from your now shuffled deck. Each player can then do a mulligan, but first they shuffle that hand back in before drawing a new one. You only get one mulligan. A game of Sorcerer's Arena is played over multiple rounds, where each character activates once. At the end of a round, if a player has 20 or more crowns, or either player had to draw from their deck but couldn't, that round, the game ends. The player with the most crowns wins. In the result of a tie, more rounds are played until one player has more crowns than the other at the end of the round. Now, at the start of each character's activation, there's a number of things that happen. Status effects count down, with triggered effects going off. The active character is on a victory point spot on the board, of which there are three of. They gain a crown for staying there for an entire turn. Knocked out characters return to play at full health, and the active player draws one card. Yes, you draw a card at the start of every character activation. That is like the hardest to remember rule for no good reason. You draw at the start of your turn, not at the end. <laughs> now, the movement action and skills phase is next, and is the meat of the game. Each character can do any or all of these options in the order they choose, though each action must be completed before moving on to the next. So in the move phase, you move the active character a number of hexes up to their default movement value. Optionally, you can discard any movement card for any character from your hand to add one to this. Instead, though, you can play a movement card for the active character and do what it says on the card. In the action phase, you can attack a rival using the active character's default attack, and optionally discard any attack card from any character to add one damage to this attack. Or play an action card for the active character and do what the card says. Now, many actions deal damage to rival characters. This is tracked using the colored dials on each standee's base. When a character gets to zero or less health, they're knocked out. The opposing player gains crowns equal to the number shown on the knocked out character's char character card. The KO'd character, of course, will return to play during its next activation. This is actually one of the big differences from the mobile game, as in the mobile game, the entire point is just to eliminate all opponents. That is a big change. The last option is to use a skill. Each character has one or more skills unique to them. When choosing to use skills, you can activate one or more of the character skills in any order. Now, this is what we meant by the basic mechanics being pretty basic, very simple. Now, what really makes this game fun and interesting is what those movement and action and combined movement action cards do. Through card play, you could have Mickey studying up to be a wizard by collecting broom tokens. Aladdin could be slipping through the crowd, gaining the stealth skill so he's harder to hit. Dr. Facilier could be shrinking his rivals, and Sully could shout out a bellowing taunt, forcing all attacks to target just him for the remainder of the round. There's one other thing to watch for when playing the full rules, and that's gears. Each card has a gear symbol on the bottom right of the card. After each phase, you check the gears in your discard pile against your character cards. Each lists a set of gears required to level up. When you've hit this total with a character, you remove the set of cards from your discard from the game and flip over your character card, unlocking a new permanent character ability. Now, once a player is done activating their character, they then discard down to their hand limit and end their turn. Now, again, the game continues until you get to the game end, which we covered earlier. But as a reminder, someone ran out of cards or someone hit 20 crowns. And again, if you're tied, just keep playing multiple rounds until someone has more crowns than the other. Now, the game also includes a four-player team variant, where each player controls two characters and you form four-on-four -four teams. The only real rule change is that a player can use a card in a teammate's discard pile to level up one of their characters. Yeah, and information is perfectly valid to be shared between. You can talk strategy, you can show each other your cards, and so on. And what's nice is the game does come with just enough characters to make two four-character teams. Now, a lot of Disney games have come out, especially in the last couple of years, it seems like, from 
hobby board game companies, not just mass market games and versions of Uno and Monopoly. Um, and due to that, I never know what to expect from any particular Disney game anymore. Game with a Disney name doesn't mean anything to me now. It used to be if I saw Disney on the box, this was a kid's game by default. This is a game that kids are going to enjoy and parents may or may not enjoy playing as well. This is definitely not the case anymore. While some newer Disney games are for kids, the majority, especially the ones coming out of the hobby game market, are not only for adults, but also for experienced gamers. Check out our reviews of Smash Up Disney Edition and or some Disney Sidekicks for some examples of this. Now, personally, I'm not sure what to think about this. Like when I see the Disney name, I expect family friendly. Not necessarily a kid's game or something for little kids, but a game that the entire family, kids and adults, can enjoy together. This one, we probably could have anticipated had either of us played the mobile game in advance of the board game, as the no. mobile game is currently celebrating its third anniversary, and has been, so has been around a little longer. Yeah, now I, I'm just really happy that this particular game fits what I just talked about. This, to me is deserving of the Disney name. And I don't want to sound that pretentious, but it nails that sweet spot. It's perfect for families, casual Disney fans, as well as being an engaging skirmish game for hobby gamers. And the secret to this is that four chapter onboarding system presented in Sorcerer's Arena. Now we've been going on about onboarding for some time now, yeah. and it's great to see it when companies really understand the need and implement it. Yeah, so when you start off this game in Chapter 1, you just have a two-player skirmish game that you can play right out of the box. Now, this is something more games need to do with the way the flash-in-the-pan board game industry right now is. People don't want to necessarily prep or read the rules or have to put everything together. This lets you put the game on the table, read the first few pages of the rulebook, and get playing. You only have two characters per side, which are already set. Set initiative order. There's no decisions to make. You get to go right to the game. It removes most of the more complicated rules and interactions. You don't have skills, character cards. There's no way to boost your movement or anything like that. Even the point goal is lower, which makes it a shorter game. Again, better suited to new and younger players. This is not only a fantastic way to get the game to the table right away and to introduce the basic rule structure and mechanics. It's a great way to then later play the game with younger kids. Yes. Now, that said, this is still a family weight game, even at chapter one. This is not a kid's game. This is not one for little kids. There is a lot of reading required. This is a card game. You've got to be able to read the cards and learning the action cards, dealing with status effects and the different card combinations does require some skill. I would think this would probably be good for eight year olds, potentially younger if your kids have gaming experience. The ability to understand the interactions and consequences of actions is really that key. It's one thing to read the words and understand them, but another level on how to grasp, how to make use of what you read. But I still say you, under 13, 13 plus what the box says, and I think that's quite high. I think at least by just sticking with chapter one, you could go way younger. Now, bumping it up, chapter two is probably the level I'd want to use to introduce the game to new people. Um, here, you're going to actually draft your team. And I think that's the big thing is you're not forced into the pairings that come in the initial game. This way, everyone gets to play who they want. And because of that, you're going to now get all the different status effects in play because you have all the characters in play. To me, this right here, chapter two, you could stop. You have a great light skirmish game at this level. While simple, it's not simplistic. You're still dealing with ranges and movement as well as spells and choices and spending or saving. It would actually be a great way to take the teach the basics of skirmish game games in general. I agree. Now, for me, chapter three is when the game started to really shine. Now you have character cards with variable base movement and attack values, character skills leading to more decision points and ways to influence play. This is probably the level I would use to introduce the game at a hobby board game event. Unsurprisingly, this is where the asymmetry is introduced. And so, of course, that's where Mo is going to become most interested. <laughs> I would say it's not introduced here because everyone's deck is different. Asymmetry is there from the first game. Everyone's character deck is completely different in this game. But there is more asymmetry added at this point. Now, the final chapter actually only introduces one new thing to the game, and that's the gears and leveling up system. Now, this is a cool part of the game, and I get why they saved it for last. 
when introducing the game to hobby gamers who have played other card driven skirmish games, I would probably just start right with the full rules right at chapter four. Yeah, speaking of diving right in at chapter four and the full rules, there's an awesome combined rule book you can grab for free that skips the entire chapter format altogether for those looking to just jump into the full game right away. It's on Board Game Geek and easily found with a Google search, and we'll be sure to toss a link into our show notes as well. Yeah, and this is actually strongly recommended by the designer of the game, who will, if you tweet about this game at all, jump into your thread and provide you a link. Now, personally, though I had fun learning the game bit by bit, I, I liked doing the onboarding. To me, that that was a, an enjoyable way to experience the game. I love that I got to break it out right away. Yes, I am the type of gamer who sits down and reads the whole rule book. In this case, I didn't. I read chapter one, then sat down and played chapter one. Then while my opponent sorted the cards, I read chapter two because the rule book's not that big. I found that was great. Even better, the onboarding was fantastic for my kids. My two kids are both at different skill levels when playing games. And we got to a point where it was worth stopping for the youngest, whereas the oldest wanted to keep going. And I thought that was awesome. What fascinated me, though, playing it through with the kids that I didn't notice when I did it with Deanna and even Sean, we played a few of these, is that the more rules that were unlocked, the quicker the game went. And the reason for that was that the characters were getting more powerful. We actually found chapter two games took longer than chapter three and four games because adding in the character skills and leveling really ramps up the damage done, the amount of interactions and how quick characters were getting KO'd. This is a small game board. And especially when you start with ranged attacks, things can end quickly if you get the right sequence of cards. Now, when looking at the entire game as a whole, like not each individual chapter, but as a box, I really dig how simple the basic system is, right? You do a bit of upkeep at the start of your turn, then the active character moves, does an action, or uses skills in any order. Do this to move around the board, control key spots, and knock people out. Then it's just a matter of possibly discarding some cards, check to see if anyone won. That's it. Like, that just taught you how to play the game in probably 30 seconds. I just dig the flow of this game. I think really most skirmish game fans probably will feel the same way. Despite the childish characters, the game is anything but childish. Now, the next highlight to me was just how different each character plays. Now, as we already mentioned, and as most of you know, I love asymmetry in my games, and this is super asymmetric. Not only does each character have its own deck with its own set of cards, and they are completely unique. There is not a repeated card. There's no, like, standard card everyone has. Different characters have different health. They have different crown values for knocking them out, and it's not just based on the health. While Maleficent might have the least health, they're not worth the least crowns because she can be nasty. So she's actually worth more than Ariel, who has exactly the same amount of health. Uh, they have different movement and attack rates. Though I will admit in the core set, there's not a lot of variety here, but there is some. They each have a different ratio of gears in their decks, which actually makes it fascinating when trying to draft your team because the cards don't have the, well, they have some, they don't have enough gears to level up in their own deck. So Mickey does not have all the gears. Mickey needs to hit level two. So you have to combo him with someone that does to be able to make that synergy work. And this just leads to highly thematic characters who feel different from each other. For example, Maleficent likes to hang out on crown spaces. She wants to control the board. That makes her cards more powerful. A lot of her cards go off at better levels if you're standing on a crown. She also has a ton of spells including the biggest damage spell in the game. But she doesn't have much health and is easily knocked out. She's a glass cannon for skirmish game fans or anyone who played any video game ever. On the other hand, Ariel, who has the exact same health, is this set's only healer. While she does have some solid attack cards, her deck is much more about moving around the board, which I think flows really well for a mermaid, and healing adjacent allies. Plus, he also, though, has the only card I've seen so far that can remove crowns or victory points from another player. This is one thing that may help drive sales in this game, as well as make for an interesting expansion roadmap. The characters seem to share, more or less, the same concepts and powers as in the mobile game. That's so players will be looking for some of their favorites from the 100 plus oh, wow. characters available in the mobile game. Uh, Isma and Tinkerbell specifically are two that I'm looking forward to seeing to see how they play in the board game version. 
I got to say, with 100 characters possibly coming, there's a lot of room for expansion here. Those characters haven't been announced yet that I know of. Now, any card-based battle game is all going to be about the cards and what they do. And I have found Disney Sources Arena does a good job of balancing both the individual character decks. So you get a good mix of, you know, balance of attack and actions and movements, because that's a big part of this, as well as balancing the potential combos and, and, and other parts of the game, which I think is impressive. Even with eight characters, it's pretty hard to balance that. This is something I hope they're able to keep up with all the expansions that have been coming out. We haven't mentioned expansions yet. While the base game comes with eight characters, six of which will be in play during any one game, there are, of course, expansions out there you can pick up to expand your options. Each has three new characters in it, and some also add new rules to the game. And we have all of these, but we'll be talking about them each in their own review in the future as we dive into them. Yeah, at this point, I'm just playing around with the base game still, still having fun discovering things. Now, in addition to expanding your game through expansions, I thought this was kind of interesting, is that each player has their own core set, or if one player, you know, is the, is the alpha gamer and picks up two of their own, uh, you can combine these. So that way, players can play the same characters against each other. While I get that in some settings this can be silly, I think it works for this particular game. Um, because you're playing summoners who are conjuring up aspects of the characters, so I don't see any, like, canon issue where we both can't have Ariel. Now, while I haven't gotten to try any of this, as I only have one set, I think the ability to duplicate would make some really interesting matches. Like the fact that a player can have a healer on both sides now is, is, is enough right there. Or seeing a character made from all the damage dealers can actually happen now. Yeah, I can certainly see groups buying multiple sets so that each person can have their favorite team, even if some of the players overlap. Stully being a great tank and combine that with Ariel's healing abilities for, uh, you know, potentially as uh, important aspects of some strategies. Now, one thing that I don't know if it exists from this game, though, I don't know if there was at least one official tournament, is if there's a meta for this yet. I don't know if this game is going to or has gotten to the level of the collectible card game where certain players have their certain three sets that are considered the best sets right now. I have no idea if the game's going to get there or if it's already there already. I, the, with the pandemic, I think they they probably missed the, the initial boat of having a big organized play program, but it's something I could definitely see coming in the future if this game continues to be popular. Overall, I am really digging Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Uh, this is an extremely solid card-driven skirmish battle game. Though the best part of this game, though, is the way it can scale. With one box, you can fight quick battle between Mickey and Aladdin against Ariel and Gaston using simple rules, which are great for younger kids or brand new players. Or you can sit down with your experienced dueling card game friend and each draft your own perfect team, battling using the full rules to determine who's the best summoner. I believe that would be sorcerer, not summoner. Yeah, for some reason, your characters are called summoners. I don't know why. In in the fluff for this game, you are summoners. I don't know. That, I guess they didn't want Disney's Summoners Arena, or they were trying <laughs> not to compete with another big battling card game where you play summoners. Could be. So they're technically planeswalkers in that game. <laughs> now, if you are a gamer looking for a solid family weight Disney game that you can play with the kids as well as challenge other gamers, this could be the perfect game for you. And it's reasonably safe to expect that with the popularity of the mobile game, this game will last and continue to expand for some time. Now, if you played other two-player skirmish games and enjoyed them, especially card-driven ones, don't discredit this game due to the Disney theme. This is a very solid battle game, especially when playing with the full rules. I think this is key. It's easy to dismiss Disney characters, and doing so would be a mistake. Just because the pictures are cartoons doesn't mean they don't have the depth of characters in other games. Now, for those who have always been curious about miniature battle games but never tried one, I think this is a fantastic introduction to the genre. And Sean actually called this out earlier, that this could be a great way to get someone into skirmish gaming. Now, one of the things that's missing from this game, and some people will miss, but others will applaud, is there's no hobby here. 
There's no painting. There's no making scenery. Uh, and their chapter-based onboarding system is really good for holding your hand while getting you started and then letting you run once you've figured everything out. Now, if you're a fan of the mobile game and would like something with some more meat to it, this will do just that. You get a lot of the game you already enjoy, but with a whole tactical layer on top of that that really explan expands gameplay. Though for now, your teams will be a bit more limited than you've likely got in your app. It'd be really nice if there was some kind of overlap, if you could scan a thing or something. I always wish whenever there's apps and games, I always want to scan my card in the game to get it on my app or some way to, if you buy something in the app, I get a version to use in my game. Now, due to the simplicity of the basic mechanics of this game, I also think this game may appeal to players who haven't played skirmish games they've tried in the past. This one can be much simpler than some of the heavy war games out there and is much more approachable in general. If you're a Disney fan especially, you might want to give Disney Sorcerer's Arena a try, even if it doesn't seem like your kind of game. Well, that's it for our review of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's core set a Disney-themed card-driven skirmish battle game from the op. If you've tried this game out, we'd love to hear what you thought and let us know your favorite three-character team in the comments below. I also want to invite you to check out my written review of this Disney battle game over on the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. There I was able to get into quite more details about what you get in the box and how to play.